What's up, everybody? Welcome to Move the Sticks. DJ Bucky back with you, Buck. I love, uh, I love you. Got the uh, Granada Hills Charter shirt on. You see, I'm, I'm repping. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. I'm I, 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 I did, and in fact, it was funny. You beat me to the punch uh, the other day. I saw that the uh, Mountaineers have some shiny new uniforms that they were putting out there. I saw like the all white. Uh, yep. I saw the black uniforms. I saw the little stuff. And before I could even text you, I saw that you had already retweeted it. You beat me oh, yeah. to the punch because I saw it on some website. Uh, it was on Twitter. They put it out there, and I was like, "Oh, okay." Look, let me just let me just make this let me make this plea because I'm sure we got folks that are excited about the new NCAA game coming out. NCAA 25. It's been 10 years since that game has been in existence, and you, you've got a chance to grab any team you want, build your dynasty, uh, and off you go. <laughs> I'm just telling you that virtual boon, and I've been told this by the folks at EA with the setting mm -hmm. of the stadium. Mm -hmm. Virtual boon is, is off the is off the charts, man. So you're gonna have a chance to have sweet uniforms. You're gonna have a chance to play in a beautiful mm. stadium that looks great in the video mm. game. So uh, you, 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 say, can hey, me, you can tell you me next, you get to walk you get to walk away with a great degree, you can be able to get any yes. job from Fortune yes. 500 companies. Yes. You can you can put the whole thing in dynasty mode, like you yes. got the full recruiting Life. skill. Yeah, yeah. Oh, hey, okay. <laughs> come on, man. For, a 40 year decision. Yada yada yada. That's where that's where we're going. Hey, it's not four years, it's 40, 40 year decision that you're gonna make you be set up for life if you come here in the Mountaineer. I get it's it. gonna be my litmus test for the game. If they have the sign, which was which I think they still have, you know, it's like Notre Dame has to play like a champion today, touch the mm -hmm. sign. Um, we had the it was like an old wood sign that coach Jerry Moore, who's in the hall of fame. I think he might even had made it himself, but it was like carved out of wood and it was a state of North Carolina. And it says, today I gave my all for Appalachian State. Got to touch that sign and off we go uh, out onto oh. the field. So I'm I'm curious, is the game, if it has that, that I'm like, I'm blown away. You know, I'm, I've always liked that. I, 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 I do like I do like rituals. I do yeah. like the, the touch thing. Like, hey, we're going to touch the rock and we're committed to give the best effort or whatever, whatever the touch thing is. You know, unfortunately, in North Carolina, I, there was nothing that we touched. You guys didn't have anything? I don't remember having a, a sign. It wasn't anything. You guys didn't touch a basketball on the way out to the football field. <laughs> we should have. We should have. We should have. We should have had Dean's been put a basketball right there. <laughs> had that thing on. Get some of that. Some of that luck and some of those good James vibes. Dean's worthy. Sam Perkins, Michael Jordan, <laughs> high five, and out we go. <laughs> we should. We should. You know what? I wonder if the basketball has a, the basketball team has a thing where they have to like touch. But I've always like that. I've always been envious of teams. You talk about Notre Dame. My high school coach. Um, a few years before I graduated, we had a player, Winston Sandry, that played at Notre Dame. So when he went up there, he was always talking about the sign and he would tell about how they would paint the helmets the night before. Oh, yeah. So I, I I do. I am a a fan of tradition. And so I do like the fact that people have certain things that they touch or that, that they kind of hit on the way out to play. Yeah. Uh, on today's show, by the way, uh, if you're wondering, we are going to answer some fan questions. So we put those out there. Uh, hashtag ask MTS. It's been a few minutes. Um, so we've we. Uh, we're going to get you some answers on those. I will say, Buck, this is uh, – I can tell when I'm ready for football season because I find myself, like, looking at week one schedules, like college, NFL. Oh, okay, like, yeah. getting – starting to get a little ramped up and a little excited here for what feels like is something right around the corner. Yeah, no, so it, 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 it's funny because you talk about that. DJ, I can tell that I'm I'm getting close to it. I have been down the rabbit hole of just listening to random podcasts with coaches previewing the season. I love um, it. Serious, uh, serious radio is doing. They were at Big Twelve Media Day, and I'm just listening to like Utah players and uh, yeah, but like I like, like I, I, can, I can kind of feel it coming on, and you know, it's, it's look the body clock. Once you get mm -hmm. past the Fourth of July, everyone knows we're we're downhill. Isn't that weird? Until the, <laughs> until the season point. starts. And I think what in the NFL, like a couple of those teams that play in the Hall of Fame game, they're about to go to camp. Like they're mm -hmm. they're rookies and stuff are about to report. So it's uh it's 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 about to be on, and I love it. I love all of yeah. it. Yeah, no, I, I'm uh, I'm fired up for it as well. Uh all right, let's uh let's jump into some of these fan questions. Nabil has pulled a bunch out of the pile here, so I'm just gonna read uh through these and we'll just kind of go through them, Buck. Let's start with the first one. Uh, first question here. This is a good one. This is from JT Busco. Uh, I better be careful reading Twitter names. That could get me in trouble because I might miss something. Uh, yeah. Inappropriate on there. Uh, all right. When you and Bucky Brooks were on the road, what were your favorite schools to visit for any reason? Go ahead. Mm. Favorite schools to visit for any reason. Okay. So one, 
this is a personal favorite. This is before Chick Fil A had expanded all the way out to the West Coast. Oh yeah, I know where you're going. Cal, Cal Poly Cal San Poly. Luis Obispo. <laughs> Cal Poly Slow was the only place where you could get a Chick Fil A sandwich. You could go to the Student Union, and somehow they had a Chick Fil A there when there were there weren't any Chick Fil A's on the West Coast. So I always look forward to going to Cal Poly Slow. Uh, I remember when Jordan Beck and those guys were there would go there and get me a little Chick Fil A sandwich. Post up. They had morning practices, so you could actually get it out because they were practice at six a.m. You know, you go do the thing, you do your film, you probably finish, walk out about one o'clock, head right to the student union, get your little Chick Fil A thing on your way out. Uh, that was what I loved. And then I would say, in terms of a school call, I would, you know, like there were a few different ones on the West Coast, but I would say like SC was always great because during that oh. time, I mean, it was it was it, rock stars. It was it was. Matt, Lyon, it was Reggie Bush. It was a like a three day visit because it had so many names, and they were so open that you not only could scout SE's guys, their film staff was great. That if you needed to do kind of like a, a recheck on some of the other schools in the pack, you could sit there and post up. They would give you a room, and you could watch Arizona, Arizona State without having to make the drive there if you want to get an early look see of what was going on in the rest of the pack. Yeah, we had, uh, you know, for those that don't know, Bucky and I were were together on the West Coast for many years uh, where the teams Bucky's with, the teams I was with. We That's really kind of where our friendship grew uh, from getting to know each other there on the West Coast. So if I'm going to go one West Coast school and you mentioned SC, which was, a you know, that was in their glory day, in their heyday. Those were awesome visits because literally it was wide open. I remember bringing my daughter when she was six or seven mm-hmm. years old. Like I just, you know, I had been gone on the road for a couple of weeks. I called the the pro liaison up there, which every school has somebody who's kind of the, the contact yeah. for scouts. And uh, I, I think it was Slu Tech. You remember him? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was like, Slu, I've been gone, man. I've been on the road a bunch. Like I just, I miss my daughter. I got to get up there to visit uh, for practice or what have you. Is it all right if I bring my daughter? He's like, yeah, absolutely. So like literally think about that. Like I'm bringing my daughter and out there watching practice, like he come over and say, hi, you're, you know, it was good on good. It was always ones versus one. So you got a lot out of it, but uh, uh, that was a great visit. But to me on the West coast, my favorite visit book, and I'll give you a couple of reasons why was Stanford. And this is even pre Harbaugh Stanford, like terrible mm-hmm. Stanford. Um, yeah. I love because it was, if you haven't been, if you haven't been to the campus, like even if you're not a football fan or sports fan, what have you, if you're listening to this for Great some campus. reason, just go to the campus. It's unbelievable. And it just, it felt like I was in a movie when I would park there. First of all, I love the fact that it was a little bit cooler because it could be hot on the yeah. West early yeah. in the year. Palo Alto is always like that perfect temperature. Yeah. You know, everything's green in California. We can get a little brown, you know, it's, you know, we don't get as much water there. It's lush and green, but you'd park your car. And I felt like I was in a movie because on the way to walk to the football facility, like you'd walk by a soccer field. So it was in the morning you get at school, mm-hmm. you'd walk by the soccer field and there's the Stanford like uh, women's soccer team practice. And, you know, there's like four or five Olympians out there, right? Because they're unbelievable mm-hmm. at all the Olympic sports. So you got this and you hear the whistle and then you see the dew on the grass. Then you walk and then up on the right is their aquatic center and there's people jumping off the high dive doing a million different twirls and you're like that's probably there's probably olympian divers there like the best divers in in the country are there and then you hear the ping 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 you can hear the baseball they're having a little bp in the morning or whatever you hear that that going on um and then you just kind of you walk and i'm like i swear to be like cue the leaves falling so the leaves gonna kind of fall as you walk into the facility i'm like this is paradise to the point where I remember, I remember telling my uh, my wife, I'm like, I wish my parents would have taken me to Stanford when I was, uh, yeah, I yeah. Mean, like in junior high, and been like, if you were work, actually study and actually work hard at academics, like maybe this is a place that you could go. I was, a, I was, a, I was a well short of uh, of being Stanford quality, Buck. Uh, yeah, look, uh, so you talk about those West Coast schools, but less because I had an opportunity on some cross checks or whatever to go to some other campuses. Yeah. DJ, I'm gonna tell you, going down. And not only doing a school call at LSU, but mm-hmm. going to a game, game yeah. in Death Valley. Like uh, people always talk about, it, and I know there appears to be a little bit of an SEC bias, but I'm going to tell you when you go to a game, a, a rivalry game in the thick of SEC country, it's different, man. It, it is electric, a night game, full of energy, good teams playing. We could talk about all the players that would come out of there, but. Good on good in a game that has a lot of stakes 
down in Death Valley, man, I don't know if you can beat that. So for a school call in a game, I don't know if there are many places better than uh, Death Valley down there in Baton Rouge. Yeah, no, that's so why I was going to go outside the region to me. That's a, a great one. I remember going down there to watch Matt Stafford on an afternoon playing against Ooh. LSU there. So that was Stafford. I think A.J. Green was on that team. That was a – and I think Georgia got after him pretty good. No, Sean Marino, I want to say, was on that Was on. Oh, that how about that? Good. It was a good group. But I remember going – that's one of my, my favorites. The Swamp, you know, during their national championship. Oh, yeah. Day. Yeah, that was a fun place to go uh, down in Florida for games like the games are always going to be in the south. And I love like Ohio State's great. I love Mm -hmm. Ohio State. But even, you know, Ohio State, Michigan, it's a different vibe when you're in the south. Like when you're in the SEC, it's just the game. The atmosphere is unmatched. Like you can't beat it. Uh, Yeah, it is. I will be my game spots. I will say I do have a funny thing. And I remember this this was post, but I went to Michigan, Ohio State, that big game and DJ like the rivalry. Like I know what a robbery is, but like I was like, oh, they, they these people really don't like each other. Like yeah. I just remember walking through, like they really don't like each other. Like the whole like team up north, like like Ohio, like they do not get along. Like that robbery is bitter. And I just remember walking through while everyone is tailgating, kind of making my way to the stadium, and I'm like, whoa, this is it has to be kind of cool to play in a game like that because this was when. Devin Gardner was the quarterback, and yeah. they were kind of going back and forth. It was a big fight in pregame. They were, and I was like, "This is bananas." But mm-hmm. I like those kinds of things. And even though you can't play anymore, you do kind of the, the the hair on the back of your neck stands up a little bit when you have an opportunity to be in those environments, that atmosphere. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, Clemson's a great spot too. Um, you've played there, so you know. But mm-hmm. that was uh, uh, that was a great visit as well. All right, uh, went a little long on that one. Let's get to the next question here. Uh, I'll take this one, Buck, and get your thoughts on it. Uh, what teams do you think the new kickoff rules will benefit most? Um, I'm going to say everybody's going to hear that question, and they're going to think of, okay, who has the returners? Who has like the backup running backs that they're going to audition in those roles? you got Cordell Patterson, I believe, back with Pittsburgh. Like You start going through that. The first thing that comes to my name, to my head, is who are the best special teams coaches? Because this is a new wow, mm-hmm. wow west. It's a new frontier. Who's going to be creative? Who's going to... Uh, do something that nobody else envisioned. So when I start thinking about that, like I, I start thinking about Fossil, uh, who's a really, really good special teams coach. It's very, very creative. Like that's one that comes to mind. So you're thinking about, you know, the Dallas Cowboys, how are they going to do it? They have uh, they have some speed there as well uh, with Turpin. So they, they've got that. That would be one team that was one of the first that came to my mind. Yeah, no, it, it, it's funny because you talk about that. It's been funny to kind of watch people try and figure out what they may experiment and do during OTAs and mini camps, uh, trying to figure out how to gain the advantage because it is such an unusual, um, it's such an unusual play right now because it's so drastically different in the way that we've seen it. I'm going to say this, DJ, it's going to change roster composition composition in terms of who we put on those teams. Cause for so long we talked about, Oh, we're going to put these linebackers and these lumbering. Safety. That's, Safety I think you're going to see, and you're gonna I see receivers you're gonna see, out there. I think you see more DBs, more skill guys, like in terms of little skill guys, because trying to block somebody in a in a small space five yards apart, that's a long time to do it. That's not something that is very natural for those mid-level bigs, those tight ends and linebackers. I think you see more skill guys there. And I will say um, the guys who are going to excel at the kick return spot are not going to be your traditional kick returners. I think it's going to be more your punt return type. Quicker than fast, maybe thicker. Short than, area, yeah, yeah, maybe thicker than you're used to seeing because they can break an arm tackle or two and go to distance. I'm excited to see what happens, and then are we going to see some special teams go say, you know what, we're just going to give you the ball at 30 yard line. Doesn't that's what I that's what I was told. The GM <laughs> that I talked to said, I don't know what the other teams are doing. We're we'll go ahead and give them the ball to 30. We're not, we'll, let this thing kind of play out a little bit. We can sit back and observe the rest of the league. We're just going to kick the thing out of the end zone, and then we'll figure it out. After that. <laughs> That's not a bad strategy. Um, all right, let's get to the next one. What's your least favorite storyline heading into the 24 season? I'll give you some time. The, the Aaron Rodgers thing is going to get old quick. Yeah, I mean, that that is one. Yeah, because, like, the thing about the Jets and all that, like, I feel like last year we did all this conversation, and after four plays it was over. Yeah. You know, like we spent a lot of time talking about Aaron Rodgers and the Jets and how good they were going to be, how he's going to bring them back the prominence and all of thing, those things. I think that's going to kind of – we're going to get tired of that 
very, very quickly. I think no, they got a bunch of national games again, too. So it's just going to be, I'm just saying from a standpoint of they're going to be talking about this on the morning shows every day. And then it's going to be, it's going to be a lot. That's what, well, well, since we're talking about quarterbacks, the other storyline that's going to go tired real quick is what happens to Dak Prescott, whether he mm-hmm. plays well or plays poorly. We're going to have to hear about it because it's the Dallas Cowboys, America's team. They're clickbait. Whenever you talk about them, you command significant attention. That storyline about Dak Prescott being a $60 million quarterback, yada, yada, yada. It is going to grow tired. But we, we may not even get a tra- get out of training camp before you're like, hey, man, I'm so tired of talking about mm-hmm. Dak Prescott and what's going to happen with them down the line. Yeah, no, that's, that's a fair one. I think those are two good ones. Um, all right, let's get to the next question here. Uh, handle this one, Buck. Best advice you would give an aspiring scout? I feel like we get that question uh, quite a lot over the years, which is a good one. Um, if you haven't heard us talk about this in the past, but uh, go ahead. So the advice that I would give is, is one, um, I'm not saying that anybody can do it, but I would say, like, begin to, like, look at players, begin to write reports of what you think reports are, begin to put like your thoughts down on paper and try to find a way to organize your thoughts that when you write a report, it reads in some kind of order that makes sense to somebody. Ron Wolf told me that I should be able to close my eyes as you're reading your report and envision the player that you're describing. So being descriptive, trying to stay away from some of the cliches and that stuff, but being very descriptive about who the player is and how you expect them to play at the next level. And whatever grading scale that you follow, I mean, there are a bunch of them that are online. Even NFL.com has a a grading scale. Just make sure that as you're beginning to think about what a player is and how he's going to project, the verbiage needs to match the grade. And remember, you're not talking about where he's going to get picked. You're grading the player and talking about them, how you expect them to play in a two to three year period as a pro. That's how it has to go. So I would really focus on those things. And I would say, um, look, if you want to get into this profession, you want to become an NFL scout. Let's just look at the math and let's just just have some common sense here. It's 32 teams in the NFL. Mm -hmm. There's what, 130 something division one teams. So if I want to get into scouting, I'm not going to even think about the NFL right now. I'm going to, if I'm a college kid, wherever I'm at, I'm going to walk into the football department and say, I want to, I want to work in recruiting. Uh, You don't even Mm -hmm. have to pay me. I'll be a volunteer. I'm going to be around watching high school players start to do what Bucky's talking about. You get a chance to really start writing reports on guys, putting grades on players, just seeing things. Right. So that's the first place that I'm going to start. Um, I'm going to then once I've established that, I'm going to start working through contacts to NFL teams Mm -hmm. saying, okay, I've got a little experience here. I've been working on it with with our college and the recruiting department. I would love to volunteer at, I'd send, I'd find the the Mm -hmm. emails, uh, which you can hunt down and find. You got to be creative, but you can go find it of like the college scouting directors of all 32 teams. And I would send emails saying, I would like to volunteer at training camp. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I, then I would go a step further. I would reach out to the marketing department. If you're majoring in marketing, I would go try and say, I'll volunteer at training camp uh, or the combine, whatever you need me to do, I'll volunteer. You don't have to pay me. I'll do something for free. Um, those are those are the types of things that I would do and just try and get inside those buildings any way you can. But start with the college because that's a lot easier uh, to come by, uh, to have some type of role. I was just at the University of Florida and they have a, a scouts room and there might have been 20 kids in there um, in their little cubicles. And they had kids breaking down players for the transfer portal. They had kids yeah. watching high school players at, you know, all this different uh, infrastructure in place there. Those are where the opportunities are. That's the springboard to get yourself into a scouting career. Yeah. And, and thinking about scouting, I'm so glad that you actually brought up the collegiate thing, because I think everyone should understand that these colleges now are operating like NFL teams. Yep. Every high division one team has a general manager who really is like a general manager in the national football league roster management talent ac- look talent acquisition uh talent evaluation they're doing all of those things and when we talk about evaluating high school players as they go from high school to college those same guys that you're evaluating now you're going to be talking about yep. uh, a few years as a pro and so as you begin to hone your your eye and kind of master your craft in that regard you're also seeing the next generation kind of blossom right before your eyes. And you've heard us talk about high school exploits 
uh, how people transition. All of that stuff matters when you, you, you're putting it together. So that's a good thing. And then the final thing, ooh, two things you said. One, just get in the building. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in Green Bay as a player when Jim Nagy was a PR intern who worked his way over to being able to kind of like uh, burn the midnight oil with John Snyder and those guys learning how to do the craft. I was also, shoot, man, Trent Kirshner in Seattle started as an intern. I know Joe Shane at Carolina. He was on maybe the ticket side and would kind of moonlight. Yep. The number one thing that you want to do is give yourself an opportunity. And the only way you have an opportunity is to be in the building. Once you get in the building, you let your dreams be known in a very respectful way. And then you find a way to kind of double dip. You find a way to work after your regular shift goes. Yep. You volunteer those late night hours to see if you can help yourself land an opportunity down the line. Yep. We had uh Right, we had somebody who was with the Cleveland Browns when I was there who was working on the uh, PR side and, you know, was in, was uh, interning, I believe, on the PR side. And he went down to our general manager and said, hey, I'm doing PR from nine to five every day in my internship. But once five o'clock ends, I'm yours. You can ask me to do anything. You want me to run to the airport to pick somebody up? You need me to organize, you know, files in your in your filing cabinet. You need me to print out new cards and, uh, you know, for your boards whatever. You're not, you're not, I'm already here. You don't have to pay me anything. I don't want any money. I just want the experience. And then he showed that type of drive, um, and that type of, of purpose. And, uh, and that ended up him getting hired on the staff there. And it's since been in the league for all, probably over 20 years now. So, um, uh, again, that's, uh, that's some good advice there. Um, all right, Buck, let's get to the next one here. I'm going to skip this next one. Go. Uh, all right, let's go to this next one here. Does Jordan Love regress this season, or does he take the Packers offense to a different level as he mince, cements himself as a top five quarterback in the NFL? So basically the question is, is he, is he stink or is he the best player of all time? Though Those are the uh, those are parameters there. What do you think? Buck? Uh, I would say there are no straight lines when it comes to player development. I think he would be a better player, but it may not be reflected in his numbers. Uh, the more experience that he has, the more things that he goes through, it's only going to help him be a better player down the line. Look, the hype around Jordan Love is real, but we got to remember, he got hot the last half of the season. The, 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 the difference between good and great in this league is consistency. Can he consistently play at the level that we saw him play the last half of the season? That is the challenge. I'm optimistic that he can get there, but man, it is hard to do it over the course of a 17 game season to play at the level that he finished. I would say that he plays not quite at that level, but I think the Packers have a good season because they are a really, really good team. I think this whole group's growing up together. Um, and, you know, I, I don't see the descending players in that group. A lot of times you see a quarterback take a step back. You're like, well, they lost the coordinator, the play caller. Um, they had some key losses in free agency, be it at, at weapons, offensive line, what have you. This whole group is young and just growing together and getting better. They've got the same play caller there in the floor. Um, I think they're going to build off what they did. So I, I think he's going to continue to climb and be better. And what a great reminder as well. I know this wasn't the question, but the different the different development plans. How about patience, man? How, how about just mm -hmm. having some patience? I find it fascinating that like the different paths, right? You had him and Herbert coming out and we, we kind of went back and forth on that. Like who was the, the better between those guys? You know, Herbert was kind of more the steady mm -hmm. Eddie. Remember love had the great year before. Mm -hmm. And then the supporting cast was, was down and he cratered his last year. And mm -hmm. then Herbert gets off to this hot start and Herbert's, you know, established himself as a premier player. We haven't even seen love play. But then once love started to get out there after having, you know, some patience and some foresight as an organization, now you look at where those guys are, you know, heading into this season, they're neck and neck, man. So it's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a great reminder that let's not be in such a rush uh, to label these guys. Have some patience. Yeah, I, DJ, I think that's the thing that we don't afford a lot of young quarterbacks. We expect them to kind of come in the league and take it by storm, almost as if they're like uh, instant grits, you know, pour a little yeah. water, put it on the stove, and then they go. But it doesn't work like that. And I think for some players, like a C.J. Stroud, uh, he was able to jump in the league and in a situation that many of us didn't think that he would flourish in. And, he, he look, he, he, he was dominant. Bryce Young goes to a different situation, gets off to a slower start. And, D.J., I would say one of the biggest stories of the offseason is we have not talked much about a former number one overall pick in Bryce yeah. Young. He yeah. has been surpassed by C.J. Stroud. People are talking about Anthony Richardson. They're talking about Will Levis. Think about no Caleb one is Williams talking, this year is number one. Yeah, like, I know, no one is talking about Bryce Young, and it just goes to show you that 
how quickly narratives and things shift in this league. I think we got to give grace to young players. It takes a while for everyone to kind of find their way. And you have to always, as a scout, you always want to kind of lean to the side of optimism, right Mm -hmm. environment, right situation, right circumstance. This player could be X, Y, and Z. You want to always kind of lean towards that. Try not to crush people until you absolutely have seen enough to be like, hey, it's just not going to work for this guy in this league. I know, uh, look, we don't have, uh, you know, it shouldn't be, I guess, in our roles, rooting for this team, that team. We root for players. He's easy to root for, man. Like, I hope I hope mm-hmm. that Bryce, you know, we see some progress there and some growth there. Awful situation he was put into. Um, so I, I'm hoping that we see a, a step there as they get a little bit better around him, uh, a little more stable, that we'll see a better performance there. Uh, let's do one more, then we'll take a quick break here, Buck. Uh Realistic expectations for Quinion Mitchell and Terry and Arnold as rookies. Do you think either one will end up as cornerback one this year on teams with Super Bowl aspirations? Man, that's let me ask you this first, Buck. Let me let me let me rephrase that a little bit. As someone who in the NFL, or those that don't know, Buck, you played on both sides of the ball. You played receiver, you played corner. Which of those positions do you think is more challenging as a year one player to come into the league? You know, as weird as it may seem, DJ. I actually think wide receiver can be more challenging because it's such a different game on offense in the pros than it is in college. Like, yeah, you can force feed the ball to young players, but in terms of route running, if you're having to like learn hot routes and sight adjust for the first time, that can be difficult to process on the island. I think at DB, you can get away with a little bit your athleticism. Uh, Re- yeah, more reactionary, right? So yeah, you, you, you can get away with that, like provided that the system is 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 pretty light. Um, I think for the guys that we're talking about, man, they're they're terrific athletes, but also technicians. I would expect them to have a level of success early, but let's let let's let's be frank. To have the kind of success that Sauce Gardner had, that's uncommon. Yeah. I think it's uncommon for a young cornerback to come into the league and be able to blanket and be a number one. But I think both of those guys can come in and be a solid number two, a solid complimentary starter in the de- defensive backfield. Yeah, I, I think they're both going to, you know, I, I have high expectations for both. I'll put it that way. Those are my top two corners in the draft last year. And I will say Quinion Mitchell's played a ton of football, um, even add the senior bowl on top of that, you know, with the amount of ball that he's played. So I think he comes as a very polished player. We saw that in the one on ones. They're just pure cover skills. So I'm optimistic there with him. And then with Terry and Arnold, look at the coaching that he's had. You know, he's mm-hmm. had NFL coaching since he got to Alabama. So I, I think you're going to see – I think you're going to see two kids who play above maybe what you would expect a rookie to do. And and Sauce is – Sauce on a different level just in terms of he's such a physical freak. He's mm-hmm. so big and so long and so loose. That was such a rare, rare combination that he had. Um, that, that – he was – he's on a different – like he's – I gave him a different grade mm-hmm. than, than the other two. So I'm not going to put that expectation on them. But I think they're both going to be really good. Yeah, I think they can be really good. And I would say this about Taron Arnold. A lot of it is he has the advantage of having a teammate who has success there in Brian Branch and just being mm-hmm. able to have those conversations and have them kind of work it out together, knowing each other. I think that should help him uh, kind of acclimate to that to the game and to the defense fairly quickly. He's a good player. They're just kind of, to me, different kind of players because you talk about Quinn Mitchell just being a freak athlete who just – kind of has the it factor. I think Arnold is just a rock solid player. And there's a little difference in grade when it comes to rock solid and someone who has special traits. Yeah, no doubt. Um, well, we'll see. Uh, we'll see what those guys look like. Let's take a quick break. We come back. We'll uh, jump into some more of these listener questions right after the break. All right, Buck, uh, let's keep it coming here. Uh, next question here. Uh, this is with speed becoming such an emphasis over size on defense, do you see a market correction type change in the NFL where teams go back to pounding the rock and emphasizing the run game, or has that ship sailed? No, I think people will go back to that, but I think we had a conversation on the podcast earlier this week where we talked about 12 personnel. I don't mm-hmm. think we'll see a radical shift where people are going old school in terms of, hey, we're going to bring the four back back and go back 21. Uh, but I think 12 personnel is going to be the way that offensive coordinators look to create advantages against the light, fast defenses that are being deployed. And if you have the tight ends that are able to block, they can create problems. So I, I do think we see it kind of come back to people are running the football or playing a little more power oriented football. But I think they're going to do it in a different way than like the 80s 
three yards in a cloud of dust. I think it's going to be more creative with multiple tight ends on the field, trying to figure out ways to really put that light nickel and those light linebackers in a bind by being able to come at them with run pass options and those things. So if you're going to ask me kind of what the next wave is, what's the next, uh, uh, what's the next kind of sea change that we see? I think we're already seeing it. And I know in talking to some coaches and we talked about this a little bit in the run up to the draft, but people are kind of asking, okay, that's it, along the lines of this question, how, you know, does this impact the linebackers? Is this mean we're going to get the big bruising backs? Like, how is this, how is this going to change? How are teams going to zig when the rest of the league's been zagging for all these years and getting smaller and faster and those things? I think it's, two positions, one position on offense and one position on defense that we're seeing impacted. I remember telling you this story, but I was talking to an uh, offensive-minded head coach, and he was saying, we're trying to find our Jawan Jennings that the Niners have, the physical slot. Mm -hmm. That's Mm -hmm. that's literally not the X receiver. That's our X factor. That is the one Mm -hmm. who changes things because he can win in the pass game, but then also if I need him to dig somebody out in the run game, I can dig him out. And think about the McVay, Shanahan Mm -hmm. tree, formations like that 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 is a valuable player so when you're saying like our team's going to change and try and go to bully ball versus all the speed that's the offensive position and then on defense to match that we're seeing big nickel we've seen that Mm -hmm. over the last handful of years and i think even more teams are trying to get away from okay i'm not going to throw my 5 880 pound cover cover nickel in there uh, who i've just said is not big enough to play outside we kick him inside because he's going to get the snot beat out of him so I need somebody with almost safety size with corner cover skills that I can put in there that can hold up versus the run if they're going to try and run at me, and then also that I can mirror and match some of these wideouts. But I think those two positions are the most that are going to be impacted by that question. And to that point, DJ, I think you can see teams carry multiple nickels, as we said. I think you can see teams have a designated corner that is the nickel corner, but then there's also going to be a play in the defensive backfield that is your nickel safety. That is the mm-hmm. big nickel. And depending on matchup, you may see the big nickel more this week and then the little nickel more next week as they figure out how do we best match up with the way that this offense is going to attack us. So more DBs on rosters, more guys that can play inside. And Look, we always think about the game kind of like floating down. Actually, yeah. it's to trickle up. College is the last three or four years. We've heard everyone being placed at the star position which is the term for the nickel positioning college we're gonna see more safeties and corners kind of vie for that nickel and they're going to play based on matchups as opposed to oh this is always my nickel defender you can have a bunch of different ways that you can get to the nickel package i'd be curious and i think they can do this with all the the stats that we can pull uh, i'll ask our buddies uh, i'll ask bill smith about this who does all the next gen stuff and i'll ask jack uh, andrade about this who's our researcher extraordinaire but i'd be curious to know the number of slot receiver snaps and nickel mm-hmm. snaps of players over 200 pounds and how that is trending like are we seeing more and more because forever right the your little slot receiver was 180 pounds. Your nickel corner might be 185 pounds. I, I feel like I know when talking to a lot of teams, they're trying to find the bigger guys for those two spots. I'd be curious, like, what's the average weight of the players who line up in the slot on offense and defense, and has it changed or is it trending? No, look, DJ, I, I think it has changed, but I think it has changed in a way that we're talking about. Uh, we're seeing more three safety packages. We've seen that you you watched that you saw how yeah. uh, Brandon Staley used to use Derwin and how Derwin, Derwin would come down, down yeah. would drop down and thing. More teams are utilizing three safety looks, and they also have in their back pocket. Oh, hey, this week we need to have three corners on the field. To me, I would say it has trended up to like a bigger presence. Where look that 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 nickel player is a hybrid safety linebacker type. He's athletic enough to cover tight ends. Uh, uh, slot receivers maybe end zone but he also has the ability to be a physical player Kyle Hamilton kind of strikes mm-hmm. me as one of the new prototypes oh, yeah. that can play that position yeah so I think it certainly has trended up to being more of a 205 210 position as opposed to a the little light 185 corner jumping in there trying to throw his body around I know that's a great question. Uh, I appreciate that one. Gave us a good conversation there. Um, What are your thoughts of Will Levis after his rookie year compared to when he entered the draft? 
Um, so Will Levis was a tough evaluation for me because I felt like he was more project than prospect, meaning that he had intriguing traits, but you didn't see the game translate enough to feel confident that he could be your franchise player. This year is really big for Will Levis because they've surrounded him with veteran playmakers that can get the job done for him. DeAndre yeah. Hopkins, Calvin Ridley, Ridley being there. He has route runners. He has people that can uncover. He also has people that can win those 50-50 balls. Now what I want to see is how does he take his game up a notch? Can he be a more accurate thrower? Can he be a guy that, look, it? not comparing him to Josh Allen, but can the playmakers help him become a more accurate passer as he also develops the mastery of managing the game? Because if he can do that, he certainly is talented enough to create problems for opponents that have to deal with that Titans offense. Yeah, I, I, look, I thought it was you know, kind of what I would expect. You saw some wild throws from him uh, mm-hmm. last year. And I want to say the Texans game, uh, I think he had two or three touchdowns. Uh, you saw, you really saw what he's capable of. He can drive it. It's big play mm-hmm. ability. I think you're going to have to be patient with him in terms of the underneath and intermediate stuff, just being consistent and efficient. But I think in terms of blasting the ball downfield, taking shots and being aggressive, he's talented, man. He's got a big arm. And I kind of like the fact, I like the fact for him that he didn't go. I mean, we're, we're talking about him going with the fourth pick to the uh, mm-hmm. to the Colts. They took Anthony Richardson. He falls out of the first round. I think that actually worked to his benefit a little bit because yes. it is the talent is there, but you're going to require a little bit of patience. And I think there's a different patience, you know, when you're, you know, when you're t- top five pick, you don't get that when you're when you fall out of the first round. Um, I think there's a little more patience there. And this is a team, to be honest with you, Buck, with with some talent, as you mentioned, offensively. Not no expectations. I mean, nobody expects them to do anything, especially Derrick Henry leaving. Um, you know, new coach coming in. I like the fact that you've got, you know, Bill Callahan there with his son uh to help that offensive line grow and develop. But I think he's in a good spot. I, th- I think if if you're a fan of the Titans or you're a fan individually of Will Levis, I think you feel good about where things are right now. Yeah, I'm with you. I think you certainly should feel good about where things stand with him. They've really gone all in. And Brian Callahan being able to take the lessons that he learned from his time in Cincinnati, working with Joe Burrow, getting Jake Browning ready to play. There's a level of adaptability that he's displayed in terms of being the offense coordinator, even though he wasn't the play caller still to put together an offense for a backup quarterback shows that you have the ability to change lanes if you need to. So for Will Levis, that bodes well to me, I'm still worried because I wonder how they're going to run the football and take some of the pressure off of him having to be the primary playmaker. But in due time, we may see them do some different things um, creatively to put together that that run game that can take a lot of the burden off of him having to throw it 35 to 40 times a game. No doubt. Um, all right. A couple more here. Uh, let's go. This is a, a fun one here, Buck. Uh, who's the most wow prospect you have studied on each side of the ball? Doesn't have to be the best player you've ever scouted, but who had the biggest wow factor in your eyes? Wow. Um, Okay, I'm going to say this on offense, and he didn't turn out to be the player that I thought, but I'm going to say this. I don't know if there was a better prospect I saw than Reggie Bush when he was at USC. The wow factor was immense. DJ, I just remember writing in my report that Reggie Bush is a combination of Marshall Falk and Brian Westbrook. And I just remember thinking that he was going to take the league by storm, that in the right – like if Reggie Bush played in today's game, I think Reggie Bush would have lived up to the expectations that many of the scouts on the West Coast have for him because Mm -hmm. the game is more open now. And so his body type, his frame, what he does really well in terms of running and catching and being on the perimeter, I absolutely believe that he could be that combination player uh, that I thought he would be. But he was the wild factor on offense. And then on defense, I'm going to say this. Watching Julius Peppers – uh, one, watching him in the draft, but two, going to Carolina and watching him develop and knowing that this was a guy who was a half football, half basketball player, but it was so easy for him. And mm-hmm. just how his game just took off at the next level, it really leads me, it, it led me to, to always value traits and pass rushers, size, length, athleticism. There's something about that that you can teach some of the other stuff but if mm-hmm. they have those things, those tools coming off the box, off the bus, they have a chance to be really dominant players in the league. 
Uh, those are great. I, you know, I've, I've told it many times. Reggie Bush was the the only eight O grade that I ever gave, which was a, a perfect grade. I never did it again. I'm like, I'm not doing this anymore. And obviously Reggie didn't end up being that perfect player, but he was easily the most like exciting. I'd use the word intoxicating. Like, you, like it was insane going to those games, seeing him live, whatever you thought it looked like on TV when you were in the Coliseum and you saw that live, it, there was nothing like mm-hmm. it. It was awesome. He was unbelievable. Um, so in terms of excitement, every time he touched the ball, you thought he might score. That that would be an obvious one for me. I'll say I'll give you another one. Um, going and watching Calvin Johnson in person um, and just seeing him, how big and fast and, and athletic and smooth. Like he was – there was a lot of wow factor there uh, with him on the offensive side of the ball, scouting him. Defensively, I'm going to give you two names that I don't think anybody would have anticipated. The first one is someone who uh, had missed time. I think he had torn an ACL in his last year. Didn't play much in college. But Antonio Cromartie's uh, tape of Florida State, he was a freak. <laughs> just so like, like, just imagine Sauce Gardner, but a little, a little stronger with unbelievable ball skills. Like, unbelievable ball skills, and a little faster too. Like he was, he was a freak. An unbelievable talent. And then the tape, like just the plays that he made on the ball, there weren't a lot. You didn't get a lot to see with him in terms of the volume, but it was crazy. And the other one I would say, the wow factor, which if you're going to say, and this is a different way to look at it, Buck, but if if you were in a, if you were in there for meetings and you were watching a little extra tape, like back in our day, you'd have to get the beta mm-hmm. tapes, put them in there, and you'd be watching tape in your little scouts room. Like I can remember pulling other scouts over to say, Bob Sanders, you gotta watch. You gotta watch this. Hit. <laughs> this, this is a different time where you allowed to hit a little bit more than you are today. But like, just in terms of flying around and like, literally, when you're watching and you can see me here, Buck. But like, how many times when you're sitting there and you're just watching and you literally go back and like you like fall back in your chair, like it's it it's jarring. It was jarring to watch how fast and explosive he was. Uh, he was an unbelievable player at Iowa. And I just remember him being muscled up. Uh, I think it was down at the senior bowl. Like, I mean, he, oh, he he's, he's traps. I mean, he is. Look, he 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 was short, but I remember at the senior bowl, like DJ, he's out there playing corner and one on ones yeah. and doing all that other stuff. And then to think about someone his size moving inside, like playing safety and being yeah. a guy that was a difference maker for the Indianapolis Colts when he was available. This dude, like, I mean, we have seen guys, and I think Buda Baker was. Uh, an outstanding prospect and we loved him but even in watching Buda Baker man it pales in comparison to what Bob Sanders was at his best when you just think about like how he just came and just came down here and hit people like just he is different I mean he's he definitely jumped off the screen when you watch the tape yeah no he was fun um and then from like he he was not I had one more name on here because I didn't scout him in college but when I got to the Baltimore Ravens Every Monday when we would watch tape with Jonathan Ogden um, and seeing him in person and and literally haven't been someone who weighed him in and he was 6'9", at times 370 maybe, a little, maybe even a, you know right around there, 365, 370, to see him you know when he wanted to, to run and pick off corners at the third level on screens and things. You're like, that is some freaky stuff, man. That is different. So it's funny. I don't. You had to be in the league when Sean Taylor was coming out, right? Oh yeah, Sean I Taylor, saw him. They we we Sean, we did joint practices with them. Sean Taylor was also one of those, and I just remember those Miami teams. One, they were so good, and I remember they were playing like two man. This dude is lined up twelve yards deep, much like Ed Reed, and he's making tackles at the line of scrimmage. I mean, yeah. just a freak show. And I, I want to say DJ, he did return punts or kickoffs, and I'm just like, this dude can just do whatever it is he mm-hmm. wants to do. I do remember distinctly being at Carolina, being in the room and just watching him and just being amazed at what he offered. And then I remember looking at his picture at the combine because that's when you would look at, you could like we would body type him and he just had this Mm -hmm. maiden Dade tattoo like on his chest. And I just remember like, this dude is the real deal. And I'm excited because his daughter is going to Carolina to play volleyball. Oh, there you go, Tar Heel. I think she's going to play volleyball or basketball, whatever. She's wearing 21. I just know she's wearing 21. I I saw it. I saw it. That's amazing. Yeah. I got to give you my quick story on that era uh, because (laughs) we would do joint practices. So there's two parts of the story. Rex Ryan was our defensive coordinator. And uh, they had sent over, it was either an email or a fax. Like that's how long ago this was. But the the, uh, Redskins at the time had sent over 
the uh, kind of the rules on what on what we would be able to do for coverages <laughs> in the joint practices. So if somebody had handed it to Rex, like in the hallway. I can remember it, they hand it to him in the hallway, Buck. So it's like he got it like this. Like he kind of took one look at it and was like, like that, threw it away. Like, yeah, we, nobody tells us what rules we're doing. So anyways, that was the first part of it. So then we get out there and it was like, it was scouting paradise. I'm, I'm telling you, we did it. It was, this one was at M&T Bank Stadium. So it was, if you were trying to see, I felt like you would like be out in the jungle to see who is the, who is the, the mm. alpha king of the jungle, the lion, you know, you see come out in single digit numbers, right? Not their regular numbers. Ed Reed comes out, single digit number. Ray Lewis comes out, single digit number. Now they, they, the jerseys are up. They're like glistening, yeah. you know, yeah. the whole thing. Suggs comes out, single digit number. Like all of our, all of a sudden, LeVar Arrington comes out, single digit oh, number. Yeah. You know what yeah. looks like. Oh, yeah. Sean yeah. Tate comes out, single yeah. digit number. Clint <laughs> Fortis comes out. And I'm like, this is, this is the, I feel like I'm, <laughs> like, I'm like, this, is, this is going down. So all these guys, right? And there, and there's just physical, like the Hall of Fame players, some of the best players you've ever seen, like just and not only as players, but as specimens and how they're out there running around and smacking people. You know who dominated the scrimmage? Chris Cooley. Couldn't cover him. We couldn't stop him. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't stop him. Mark Brunel, just Mark Brunel just doing steam routes to Chris Cooley one after another. I'm like, oh, all oh, these friends out here. Oh and my god. Chris Cooley, we got no answer. Oh man, it's such a look. One, it's a blast from the past. Two, do you remember how small that little uh facility used to be at Utah State when you would go? It was yes. almost like it, 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 it wasn't a trailer, but it, it almost like a, like a little outhouse. Like you had to go down and there was a couch. <laughs> I remember like sitting on the couch watching the tape. But Chris Cooley was so good at Utah State, like as the H back. And it was really in the middle of a run where Utah State had a bunch of like really good players that kind of would pop through there. He came through there. Donald Penn came through there. Um, there was a corner. Yeah, Bobby Wagner came through there. Um, yeah, I mean, like, Urban, uh, yeah, Robert I mean, they, yeah, I mean, they, they, they had like really good players, but man, Chris Cooley <laughs> wearing out all those body beautiful dudes. Oh, yeah, it, is so, it is so with, funny. With, 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 yeah. like, look like you like a collared shirt on underneath his pads. Like, oh know, like, man, straight, yeah. straight out of like structure. Uh, 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 I'm like, how is this happening? Yeah. Yeah, God, there's, there's some good times. Yeah, but one, all those players that you talked about, it, it really reaffirms like why body types are everything. Like yeah. in terms of oh, like man. why you like to have a team that just looks the part, like one of those get off the bus squads, mm -hmm. bigger, faster, stronger. It just looks different. Your team looks oh, different. Yeah, It we, just we creates out, a little aura. About we would come out for warmups, Buck, and it was Jonathan Ogden, 6'9", 360, Orlando Brown, 6'8", 380. Those were our tackles. Then you had Edwin Muatalo, 350 pounds. We had Benny Anderson, who was 330 pounds. Like, they were literal giants. And then you'd see Chris McAllister is just 6'2", 220-pound corner. Um, you know, Ray, you know, coming out there with his his aura, uh, Suggs, Nada. Like, we would come out there, and it was like, this game, you would walk around the field before the game. Go, oh, it's over. Like, I don't know. They got no chance. Uh, uh, I, I do remember. I remember those. And look, I'll be honest with you. Jamal remember. Lewis was 250-pound running back, was running 4-3. Like, it was, a, it was a physical team, man. And, and that's how it's supposed to be. Like, you, you want your team to look the part. And it doesn't matter where it is. I remember going to watch Alabama play. And just in, in pregame, just looking at them when Nick Saban had them, and they're just, I mean, they are just built mm -hmm. like a pro team. And you're just looking down on the other end like, oh, they, this other team oh. has no chance. Oh. Yeah, no shot. It, it, it Look, it, it matters. Like, there's something about the physicality and just the body type that you want to have when you're building a championship caliber team. Last story on that. Uh, do you remember when uh, – and we actually – I believe we had talked to uh, – with, it was Brian. I don't remember if it was Brian Kelly was the coach in that Notre Dame team or not when they yes. played Alabama because we talked to him it about changed. that. He, he yeah. said it changed his recruiting. How he recruited. And look at how you know Notre Dame became an offensive line factory after that. But my story on that one is I'm down there for, on the field before warm-ups. Notre Dame is kind of out there first, right? So they're warming up. And I'm down in the end zone. And I actually took a picture. I don't know if I posted it, but like uh, Vince Vaughn. I loved Vince Vaughn, right? Like he was like uh, one of my favorite. Yeah, favorite yeah, yeah. Big Notre Dame fan. And he's down in the end zone and he's talking with different people. And he's like, so it's like Vince Vaughn, like Mr. Hollywood, excited, smiling. 
And then Alabama came running out of the tunnel and it was like Fluker and Womack, Warback and all those guys. And I just, I was watching him. He went from so jovial, happy Vince Vaughn to like, slow, slow. like yeah, this has got no shot, bud. <laughs> it is funny though. I do remember one of the times that Brian Kelly came on the show. He talked about how that changed the way that he recruited at Notre Dame. He said when they played them down, I guess it was the Orange Bowl or, or it was whatever game. Yeah, he, he he just said, yeah, we have to change how mm-hmm. we go about it. And right after that, that's when they kind of became like the offensive line factor. They had a great run of offensive linemen that came out of there. They were a much bigger team. They were faster, but they were bigger and far more physical than they had yeah. been in the past. And that was just the residual of the reaction to getting hammered by Alabama in that bowl game. No, no, it was, uh, that's a good one. I think that's a good way to uh, to finish it up there, Buck. This was a fun one today. We appreciate everybody uh, dropping us those questions. Uh, it's always great to hear from you guys and what you're curious about. Hopefully, uh, we got a few of those answered for you. We'll do that again. There was a bunch more we weren't able to get to, but we'll we'll do another one of these before we get to the start of the season, another offseason uh, uh, hashtag ask MTS. Anything else you want to add before we jump out of here, Buck? No, this is fun. I appreciate the uh, the listener your feedback it's always good when we can have an interactive show we can answer some of the things that you guys have top of mind yeah, no doubt um appreciate you guys hanging with us we will see you here next week three brand new episodes coming your way next week right here on move the sticks